Hello. Oh, perfect. We'll get started in like 30 seconds. 30 seconds. All right, guys, uh, welcome. Um, it's good to see everyone's faces and people. Uh, come in, come in, come in. Um, before we get started, why don't you say hello to someone? I know you, a few conversations, but we, we've got a, you know, some old faces I haven't seen for a while. Make sure you say, tell them hello. And for those online, hello. Uh, you can spam the YouTube channel to say hello to each other. But yeah, say hello to someone. Say hello to someone you haven't seen for a while. You can get up, shake someone's hand, give them a fist pump. Anything like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know, I know. All right, well done, guys. Uh, welcome to those online as well. Um, yeah, we just got a few announcements today. 
uh, very easy. So AGM is next Sunday after church at 12.30 p.m. in the main chapel room. Um, if you haven't received your AGM pack and you're a member, please let me know or Shelley know, the admin staff. Um, we've got a mission, mission convention which we have each year. And so this year's mission convention is a lady called Vera from Hong Kong who is also serving in Thailand since 2011. So she'll be preaching on uh, September 11 in a combined service. And we're also going to have a combined service in October with uh, Pastor Matthew Oi, who you guys know. So we are supporting him as a missionary as he goes to Japan, actually. Uh, and he's going to Japan early next uh, year. Um, and that's it for announcements. Praise the Lord. All right. <laughs> Let's get straight into worship, shall we? And we've got a few new faces here today, I think. Is that right? I want to say hello, Christina and Sandra. Hello. Yay. <laughs> Woo. All right. Can I pass it over to you? All right. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. <laughs> It's great to be caught out by your pastor. (laughs) Anyway, um, yes, we do have Christina and Sandra joining me Emerald for worship, which is amazing. Youth, you can do it. Um, We actually will be having reverb later, and lovely Edwina is going to come to talk about worship as well. So anyone who's interested, bring along your own lunch. Come to reverb today because it's going to be good. All right, let's worship all together. I can invite everyone to stand with me and our worship team as we sing praises to him. Welcome to Move Around if we're blocking the way, because I realize if you're on this side, we might be blocking the screen. So feel free to move. You don't have to stay where your seat is. I actually might invite everyone to close your eyes and just breathe in, breathe out. Let's do that two more times. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. I find that often if I'm leading or I'm serving or I'm here just to attend church, I bring a lot of stuff with me in my head and in my heart. And I guess sometimes I think, oh, do I hide that? Do I show that? Do I put it aside so I can lead youth? And often people around me who care about me tell me, What's, how are you going? What's going on? That's an invitation for you to bring it. Bring whatever's been going on in your life, whether it's praise God, our baby is healthy, praise God, I have friends, praise God, I've got through a really, really bad week. Or God, where are you? What's going on? Help me get through my studies. Heal me, Lord. Help me sleep through the night. I want to invite you all to bring that. Speak to God through your heart today, during worship, during the message, during fellowship. All of it. Bring it. Because God can take it. So with that in mind, let's praise him. We're going to sing Forever Rain. You may open your eyes now.
God, you are more. You are more. You are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord. You are Lord. All creation will proclaim. You are here. You are here. In your presence, I may hold. You are God. You are God. Over us, I'm letting go.
shall come. you all just to bow your heads and we do a quick prayer before the next song. Dear Lord God, we praise you for you are good even when we're not, for you are peace when we're scared, you are life when there's death that's, that's there, but Lord, you, you promise eternal life through the, your son, Jesus Christ. So as we sing the next couple of songs, Lord, remind us of you on the cross. Remind us that you sacrificing your life to save our souls, to wash away everything that we've done against God, against you, Lord, so that we can be in companionship with you again. We can be in a partnership with God again. Is the most amazing love. So help us to remember to learn about that and to also send out people and ourselves to send that good news to everyone around us. Thank you, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So our last couple of songs is going to be merged together, Amazing Love and Once Again. And they pretty much speak about the same thing, Jesus Christ and his sacrificial love for us on the cross. For those who have been with us for a while and a bit older, you guys know this song, so sing loud. Um, for our young Euroverbians, this song used to be sung when I was your age. So think about that. Amazing love.
Alex, Catherine, Emeralds, Sandra, and Christina. Well done. Yay. Was it scary? Nah, easy. You're on next week then as well, right? <laughs> nah, good stuff. Um, it's always really exciting to see uh, our Reverbian step up and run the service. So hopefully one day they'll run the whole service. Come on, guys. You guys ready? Yeah. Um, now comes the time of offering. So uh, you will see behind your chairs there's a QR code um, uh, to access our bulletin. So obviously we're all doing everything digitally these days. So if you'd like to look at the bulletin, scan that QR code. And in that bulletin you'll also have our um, tithing details as well. Um, I wanted to share something, yeah, that's been on my heart in terms of offering. I know a lot of you um, don't have work yet, but you will, or some of you have part-time jobs, for instance, you know, at McDonald's or Sushi Sushi, wherever you guys work, right? Um, I know a lot of people work at a sushi store for some reason in this uh, church. However, um, that's not the point of this message and offering. Uh, I, I find this principle of giving to God and him being generous with us, quite an interesting principle. And in Malachi, and towards the end of it, um, the Israelites, he, uh, God accuses the Israelites of, 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 of stealing the tithe, if that makes sense. So they're giving not their fruits, first fruits, not their best fruits. They're giving like basically their scraps to God, right? Like you could call it pocket change to God. And God accuses them of this. And what they say back to God is like, how have we done it? How have we, you know, s stolen your tithe away from you, right? And God says, um, because you haven't given me your, your best, right? And he says, in the word of God, and I understand it's in the Old Testament, but the same principle, I believe, still applies today, that if we give to God, right, and test him in this, he will unleash the storehouses store, store of heaven upon them, right? And it's funny, because... I know that for me, uh, giving to God, especially initially, is not easy. It's like you think it's our money, right? Like we, 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 earn, we work hard for our money, yeah? We, we want to put in our savings account to buy, you know, that nice dress or that game, new gaming computer or a new car, for instance, or, or a house deposit for, a, for an investment property, you know? And we, we, we tend to look at only what we have in our bank account. I'm like that. Right? I look at the bank account, I count, you know, I used to be a, a financial analyst, so I, I look at numbers all the time, right? But one thing a preacher said recently that when I was on leave that just struck me so much, right? It just tore my soul apart, like you could say. It just really hit me. He said that often, as believers, we only look at the physical things in front of us. We only look at the physical resources in front of us, but we do not take into account the invisible resources that God has. We, we, we don't. Because I look at my bank account, oh, there's only $900 in there, right? I have this scarcity mindset. But in God's kingdom, His resources are totally unlimited. Totally unlimited. And when the Bible says, when you give to Him, He will pour out blessing upon you that you cannot even store, I can guarantee you it is true. You know, I took a, obviously took a huge pay cut um, working from ANZ to become a pastor, right? And I thought it would be an easy change, and, I, and you guys know this story. It was one of the most difficult changes to my lifestyle I've ever had, right? I was like, oh gosh, money is really important now, you know? I can't just, you know, buy that nice jacket, that Zara coat, that, you know, LV wallet, whatever. I can't buy those nice things anymore, you know? And all what I want to now that I'm a pastor, right? But I can tell you, testimony after testimony after testimony since I've been a pastor or since I've gone to Bible college, God just doing miracles in my finances, even when I remained constant with the tithe, right? If you give to God, he will outgive you a thousandfold, right? I, I mean it. I don't even know where this money comes from. Let me give an example. I, my, my, car, my car broke down, uh, this is probably about a year and a half ago, right? And, you know, i we were saving for a house deposit. No, sorry, it was probably more than a year and a half ago. It's like two and a half years ago, right? We were saving for a house deposit. And it would have cost me approximately about almost $4,000 to get that rep car repaired, right? I'm sitting there, oh gosh, that's a lot of money. And we're trying to save for a house, right? And obviously planning for kids, all that kind of stuff. So I'm, in my mind, I'm really worried, right? I'm like, oh gosh, where's all this money going to come from, you know? Um, and I tell you what, 
when you give to God and you are faithful in the tithe, when you start giving that, you know, $10 that you might owe God because you earn $100 in that shift, right? He will give to you. And so what happened to me was that for some bizarre reason, Toyota, when I took it there, they're like, this is going to cost you a lot of money, right? I'm like, oh, crap. For some bizarre reason, they decided to talk to head office and, and the head office said, yeah, actually, we'll just cover it completely. A complete, not even like 50%. They'll be like, yep, it wasn't even their mistake. It was just an you know, old computer chip, whatever, and it had to be replaced. They said, yeah, we're going to cover it for you. Not, my car's not under warranty, right? It, it made no sense from a business sense to cover my $4,000. None at all. But let me tell you, I could tell you time after time after time after time, that's happened to me, just miracles. I can guarantee you miracles will happen when you give to God and are faithful, right? So as we think about offering today, have you given that 10% to God? I know it seems like a lot of money, but trust me, do not look at the physical resources you have in front of you. Understand that there are invisible resources that are unlimited to God. And when he sees you honor him with that particular offering, he will honor you, I guarantee it. That's not to say we, we give to receive. God loves a cheerful giver, although I struggle with giving sometimes. <laughs> you want to hold that tightly? But trust him. And so as we reflect on giving to God, let it be our sushi sushi job. Let it be our in- investment income, right? Let it be our side hustles. Think about this principle. I guarantee you, he will not fail you. With that in mind, I'm going to pray for us. If you'd like to make an offering, uh, you can do so cash-wise, uh, somewhere uh, don't give it to me uh, but we we have bags somewhere and or, or you can donate online all right so i'm going to pray for us and i'll pass it back to yeah to eden soon and the scripture reading with joe all right i'm going to pray lord i want to thank you that your word never fails what you promise what you plan it's not something that changes You're not double-minded, but it's a promise that is always true and a principle that's always true, that we cannot ever outgive you. When we give to you, God, you always give back to us in some way, shape, or form. So I ask today that we would be a super generous generation here at CACV, that we would not be stingy with giving to you, but try, even though we may wrestle with giving, but to give to you cheerfully, Lord. I ask, Lord God, that you would anoint this church and this congregation for the gift of giving, that we will have an abundant mindset and not a scarcity mindset, Lord, that we will not be stingy with you, but that we'll be generous with you today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So this time comes to a time of scripture reading before I invite uh, Uncle Eden up. And so Joe, Louis, Joseph. Does everyone know Joseph? Yeah, I think so. But it's great to have him here. He's Sam's brother, so welcome. So, uh, Joseph, over to you. So today I'll be reading from John 4, verse 1 to 30, and then 39 to 42. Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw near draw water, Jesus said to her, Will ye give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with the well and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you, are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, 
Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so, I, so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus said, replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for our salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are, kind of, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The disciple rejoined Jesus. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking to her? Then, Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. And now, 39 to 42. Many Samaritans believed. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So, when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. I'll pass the time to Eden. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant job, Joseph. I like your firm and assertive way of reading the Bible. It is good, you know. It's, yeah, the Bible is um, the Word of God. Okay. Hello again. You haven't seen me for two weeks. <laughs> Guess where I went? I went to Darwin. <laughs> That's my first holiday after what? How many? Well, away from Melbourne, I mean, uh, after two and a half years from the pandemic. It was scary to start with because everyone, you know, you, you're still worried about when you go on the airport and playing is, you know, many people there and you wear your mask and you know, should I take off my mask or should I wear it, you know? And then once you get there, it's not that bad, you know, it's, everyone's relaxed and yeah, thank God. Um, yeah, he protected me all the journey. And all my companions as well, my friends are going with me. So we have a group of six going together. And uh, yeah, it was a, a lovely time. time. Um, interesting, I, I learned something from the trip that the, um, um, the Aboriginals, well, we call them the, the people of the First Nations. It, it's a lot up there, you know, it, and also a lot of the, the parks belong to them, you know, and... Uh, they have, in their culture, they have a very close connection with what well, they call that their God, you know. And, uh, and, and they have a, a special way of managing the nature. You know, they only take what they need. You know, uh, you know they won't exhaust all the resources, like they won't kill all the animals and, you know, uh, or, or, or fish overfishing, you know, put big nets and you know, they only catch one or two. It's enough for the day. It's enough, you know. And also, they 
they burned, um, they set fires to the, to the bushes. Not because they want to destroy the bush uh, with bush fire, but they actually wants to regenerate the, the vegetations, you know. And also, they, they set the fire um, slowly. They have a special way of um, setting up the fires, setting off the fires. So the animals and the insects have time actually to run away from the fire. So very interesting. They have a very close connection to their God, but we're not sure whether their God is our God. <laughs> but uh, they are talking about their God is the creator, which is likely, well, our God is definitely the creator of the, you know, earth and universe, you know. And uh, yeah, but it's quite interesting, something I learned uh, from the Aboriginal culture, you know. So back from the, my trip, <laughs> sorry for the time. Um, today's uh, sermon is on the heart of a Samaritan woman. It's uh, John 4th. Uh, I'm sure you guys are very, very familiar with this story, you know. Um, Jesus, you know, he had some, you know, he's done some mission work, you know, uh, in, the, um, you know, Judea. And then because he, in verse said, in verse 1 said, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had learned that he was gaining, baptizing more people, more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was Jesus, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he's left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So the story starts from here. Okay, so Jesus went, start going back from Judea to Galilee. Okay, so before we dive deeply into the scriptures, shall we have a prayer? Just to ask the Spirit to give us that uh, insight to understand the deeper meanings of the scripture. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the wonderful weather. Sun shining through the windows, Lord. We praise you because spring is coming and we can see uh, all the plants are springing to life, all the flowers are budding and, uh, um, yeah, and, uh, and you know, all the, all the trees are, are having new leaves. And it's getting a bit warmer as well. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, we uh, ask you to really um, open our eyes up and open the eyes of our hearts that we can understand the deeper meaning in the scripture and help us to take away what you have for us today. Thank you, Lord. We praise, uh, we praise you and uh, pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, it's a, it's a very familiar story, but mind you, the scripture is alive. In every situation, in every different time of your life, that story might mean a different meaning. I can testify for that. I have read or have read the Bible, you know, same stories many times. But every time I read sometimes the same story, but the story actually gives me a different meaning that time. So don't expect same old story. The Spirit might give you new things today to take away. Okay, so the story starts from when Jesus starts going back from Judea to Galilee, okay? So there's three routes um, that, sorry, I don't know how to use this one. <laughs> there's three routes that uh, from Judea to Galilee. If you imagine, Judea is on the north, in the north. And Samaria is in the middle. And Galilee is right underneath uh, Samaria. So to go through 
you know, to go to uh, Galilee, somehow you got to pass Samaria, you know. Um, a lot of the Jews try to actually avoid it, avoid passing through Samaria because the Jews actually have a belief that the Samaritans are not so good people because, uh, well, there's a bit of history on it. I'll, I'll talk to, the, I'll, I'll go to that later anyway. Um, so, um, but if you look at the, the, the scripture, verse 4, what did, what, what's the scripture saying? Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. Had to. Why is it had to? You can go other ways, go right round. A lot of Jews actually take that route, right, go right round, avoid Samaria. Why? Why Jesus had to go through Samaria? Because it is a missional journey. There is a divine appointment there. God has organized a Samaritan woman at the well for Jesus to talk to. Jesus had to go to Samaria. In our um, wonder if you had chance to participate in some mission work, you know, like maybe handing out pamphlets in the uh, bus stop or going to uh, our church went to Ballarat for a long time for almost 10 years. I think it was uh, maybe 10 or well, five, six years ago, could be. And, but that was like 10 years for, for, for a period of 10 years. We stopped going there because they have already got uh, their own uh, pastors and stuff. We went to support a group of uh, Christians, or, and some of them are actually is a, like a little Bible study group. They were mainly composed of Chinese workers in there. And uh, we went there to support them to run um, Bible, to lead Bible study with them, to pray for the people there. It's a mission, mission trip, you know. So, yeah, I wonder if you had done those type of things before. But if you had done those things before, then you should know why Jesus had to go. Because for all mission work, you need to be intentional. It's not because, okay, I'm free on that afternoon, I'll go. Or I'll have some free time. Okay? After I've done all that, after I play on the, on the computer, after I had a chat with my friends, after I've done my gym work, then I'll go. No. Mission work has to be intentional because this is actually, it's coming from the heart. You do mission work not because it's a responsibility. You do mission work, you want to spread the gospel, the good news with other people, with your friends, with your relatives, because it's such a good news. It, and it's actually bringing, because you have enjoyed and, and experienced the joy, the peacefulness, the sort of, it, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's a feeling that you can't explain. I don't know what's, a, it's an awesome feeling, you know, when you, uh, after you accept Christ and you, you can enjoy that, um, the Spirit with you, you have a total different look in your life. All your values, what you do, how you make your decisions are all new. Your perspective are changed. So, you do it 
because you want to share that good news with them, with people. You don't want to. You, it's not a, out of a duty. Oh, I'm I'm the, you know, I'm the I belong to a certain group and I have to go there. No, don't do that. You do that because you have that desire in your heart, and the spirit actually will move you to if you have a good connection with the spirit with God. So Jesus had to go through Samaria because he needs to meet a lady in the in the well. So the story continues. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sika or Sika. <laughs> I have to ask Pastor Andrew. I'm not sure how to pronounce that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll pronounce it Saika, okay? Uh, so he came to a town in Samaria called Saika, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his sons Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Okay. In, in the text we just read, Jesus actually, by the time he came to the well, it was about noon. I, I wonder if you could have been to a semi-desert area. This is a semi-desert area. Similar to areas like um, maybe Alice Spring or Darwin, where I just went. Semi-desert area. By noon, morning, it's quite nice, you know. I just went there, it's like morning was like 24 degrees, quite nice. By the afternoon, by 11 o'clock, it's like 30 something. And by the, you know, and by the evening, it cooks again. So, um, yeah, obviously, Jesus has walked for a few hours and uh, he was tired. Wonder why Jesus was tired. He's the Son of God, He's God Himself. Why? Any, anybody? Have any idea? Because he's the son of man as well. Jesus is fully God and fully man. So he's tired. He sat down by the well and talked to this lady. Now this lady came to um, ask, you know, as, uh, came to the well to draw water, obviously. It's, it's quite interesting about um, why Jesus asked this Samaritan woman for a drink. Let's, let's continue the text and uh, we'll, 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 we'll talk about more on that. So when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, well, would you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Quite interesting conversation, isn't it? Like, um, why I say it's quite interesting, Jesus asked the woman for a drink, because it's, well, those in, in culture of those days, the Jews rarely talk to a Samaritan because they classify them as, or they see them as unclean people. Um, there's a, a, a little bit of history, I think, um, relating to that. Uh, Samaria was like um, split from the Northern Kingdom. Uh, before, you know, some time, some time ago. I can't remember exactly the, 
dates. Let's, let's see if I have it down here. I might have. Where is that? Uh, the one that ah, yes. So um, it's split from the Northern Kingdom around 722 BC. That's because the, uh, there's a bit of rebellion. In those days, Assyria actually, you know, ruled the whole part of uh, Israel, you know. And uh, there was a bit of rebellion, and then it split into two places. The Samaritans um, hold a different idea from the um, Jews. They only believe in Yahweh and the Pentateuch, and they reject the rest of the Old Testament. So that is why, and they worship, the, um, they even set up their own temple in Samaria, and you know, they don't worship in Jerusalem. So it, it's a lot of history on, uh, or a lot of tension between the two uh, tribes. And uh, the reason why the Samaritan woman gave that sort of response, you know, it was like a quite a cool or cold response. You, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you well, talking to me first? Not, not uh, saying that you asked me for a drink, you know. So, quite interesting. Jesus initiate that talk to ask the Samaritan woman for a drink. And also, there's also um, in some um, theologians, they believe that uh, it's quite interesting or quite strange for a woman to come out and draw water from the well at that time of the day as well. Because usually they don't do that in their culture. They do it in the morning and evening because that's the hottest time of the day. So they don't normally don't do that. And also, there's also one word quite interesting. Alone. He came. The Samaritan woman actually came by herself. Now, in cultures of those, of those days, the ladies don't go by themselves to the well out of the city because it's not in the city, all right? It's out of the city because they have to travel in groups because there's, well, bad people, you know, in the, in the, in, in the, in the hills or, or in, the, in the mountainous area. And uh, so it's quite interesting. You bear in mind these this two points. So the lady came to well in a funny time and also she was alone. So what uh, the, when Jesus asked her for a drink, will you give me a drink? The answer is, you are Jew and I am a Samaritan. I have nothing to do with you, almost, you know. How can you ask me for a drink? But instead of, you know, trying to explain, you know, oh, you need to give me a drink, I'm very thirsty, you know, I came all the way from, Judea, I've walked how many hours and all that. Jesus' answer is quite interesting as well. It's not really answering her answer, okay? What did Jesus say? Jesus answers her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. So two uh, important phrase or words in there, if you knew the gift of God and who it is they give you for a drink, you would ask him or ask me and I would have given you the living water. The conversation con continues, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, 
as did also his sons and his livestock. Well, the woman doesn't get what Jesus was talking about. Obviously, Jesus was not talking about physical things. He's talking about spiritual things. The gift of God, he's talking about spirits, the Holy Spirit. If you ask me for the Holy Spirit, we'll give you freely, you know. And it will give you living water as well. Living water in the Bible is also corresponds to the Holy Spirit in a lot of texts. You know. So basically Jesus is saying that, well, I have the gift of God. Freely he give to you. Would you like it? Then the con conversation, uh, obviously the woman doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. And you've got nothing to draw with and the well is deep. You know, how can you get this living water? He's still, they, she's still thinking the living water means the, the, well, the water in the well. Okay, it's not, it's not what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus answers again. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I gave them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them, in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Again, Jesus is talking about if you invite the Spirit to come into you, you will have like a, a spring of water. And that will lead to you will have eternal life. Because as we understand from other texts from the Bible, if we accept the gift of God, accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, confess our sins, we and ask for forgiveness, then the Holy Spirit will enter us. Once the Holy Spirit enters us, we will be able to connect with God again. Because because of sin, we are separated from God. Man is separating separated from God because of sin. But if we accept the gift of the Holy Spirit, once the Holy Spirit enters our body, our, you know, our hearts, we will have a connection. It will open up that connection with God. And we can talk to God and God can talk to us as well. So this is what they meant by, what Jesus meant by the water I gave them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Eternal life doesn't mean that we we'll live forever physically, okay? No, it's not like that, okay? Because otherwise, there's not enough room for us to stand on the earth, okay? Imagine if every one of us, you know, continues eternally. It's an eternal relationship, an eternal fellowship with God in our spirits. So as we, you know, finish our journey on earth, our spirit will leave the body. If you have already accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will have an eternal fellowship with God. That's what he meant by eternal life. So the woman gets interested. I don't think he, she fully understands what Jesus meant in those answers. But the woman said, mm, well, if I, if I can get this water and I'd never be thirsty, why not? Okay. So the woman said, said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. 
So he, she still takes it literally, literally taking the answer. Um, but the next uh, answer really hits her. As the con conversation continues, he told her, go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Wow. That really struck the woman because Jesus never met this woman. How would he know that this lady had five husbands and the man just living together with her now is not actually her husband? So the woman's answer is, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestor worships on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So he, somehow the woman accept, accepted Jesus or re, come to the realization that Jesus is not a normal, just a simple man, just a simple Jew come, that just come to the well to drink a bit of water. He's some, somebody who is quite special. Or maybe in her vocabulary, all she can think of is he'd probably be a prophet. But because of that conversation, it reveals the sin in the lady's life. And that has caused all the you know, chain reaction after all that. Let's continue reading the text. But the answer is, sir, woman, uh, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestor worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So he acknowledged Jesus is special. But he's, she thinks still, you Jews are different from us. You worship in Jerusalem. We worship here. I can't, you know, I can't sort of like uh, associate with you, with you guys. But Jesus' conversation uh, continues. Woman, woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seek. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. I was, um, sometimes when you, um, doing mission work or going, uh, trying to share the gospel with your friends. I wonder if you have that experience. Um, it's quite difficult because they will have all sorts of answers, <laughs> answer back, sort of, like this woman, you know, always say, oh, you, uh, you, you, you're different from us. Oh, we have a different belief, um, you know. Um, you don't understand us, you know. I prefer to do this my way. A lot of excuses. But I share one of my experiences with you um, some years ago. Oh, not that far ago. Maybe four or five years ago. Remember Pastor James initiated a Take 5? Yeah? Take 5, what we call campaign. So we have to remember what's take five. 
we have to five we have to pray and ask for five names from God. Five friends or relatives that you like you that God likes you to share the gospel with. Okay? And we pray for them every day for a period of time. I can't exactly remember. <laughs> and then, you know, um, and during that time, I met a, a, a patient. I'm a physiotherapist. Anyway, if you don't know me, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I, I mm, meet, you know, many patients a day. So I met a, a patient. He's from China. Um, he's, he's quite, well, when I met him, all I know is uh, he's an ex-businessman in China. He's, he's got his, uh, what you call that, the first bucket of gold, <laughs> what you call it. You know, he's, he's earned some money anyway. So he came to Australia to, uh, to settle here and he doesn't need to work. You know, he, he's just enjoying life. He's playing golf, and, but he hurt himself playing golf, so he came and see me. Um, so uh, we just had some, you know, conf you know how you know how physios do. You know when they're working on your back, on your neck, or your legs, they talk to you. You know about uh, what you do in your, you know, in your leisure time or whatever. Actually, he asked me what you do on Sunday. I said, "Ooh, great! What a what an opportunity!" <laughs> so I was, I was, I'll tell him, "Oh, I go to church," you know. And then, um, and then I, I tell him, oh, I play golf too, you know. And then he said, oh, yeah, I play golf too. Um, but that, that conversation hasn't sort of eventuated in anything, okay. But after maybe mm, a few months, he sort of, oh, more, probably more than that, maybe six months, he come every now and then for some treatments. And then one day, he turned up. He said, Eden, you, you go to church, right? I said, yeah. And he said, can I come with you? I said, oh, all right, yes, of course. Guess what? This, is, this guy's name actually came up in my prayer in a tick five. He's one of them. And I prayed for him, I think, probably for two or three months. Nothing happened. <laughs> so... <laughs> and the take five finish. So I probably I, I I sort of still remembers him in my prayer, but I don't do that every day. So every sort of every now and then I remember this guy and say, Oh, wonder how he is, you know, all that. Um but yeah, he came he came to me one day and said, Oh, can I come to your church? He did come to my church. He did come to here. And then he joined Pastor uh well at that time, oh, no, no, it was Reverend. Sorry, Reverend Collins Bible Study Group. I was running Mandarin, and um, he actually accepted Christ a few months later in that group. So, um, why I share this is sometimes we, you know, like when we're sharing the gospel, sometimes, number one, we don't know a lot about this guy that you're sharing the gospel. There must be there might be some stories behind. I find out later that he was actually on the surface he's a happy man. But actually he just divorced from his wife with his wife. And he was really struggling. And when I so through the conversations uh, during treatment and sense, every now and then I'll I usually put in a few words of uh, the gospel or, or, or how God is working in my life. Simple, I just share how God's working in my life. How God helped me go through difficulties, difficult time of my life. And, you know, it actually sinked in to him. And he actually initiated that conversation. He wants, he wants to know more about God. He wants to know why I'm so happy all the time. <laughs> why why I, I can sort of um, 
how, how, I s how can I sort of go through those difficulties and still be happy, you know? So um, it's like the, the woman in the well, you know? Imagine if it's not Jesus. Ob obviously, Jesus is the Son of God. He's God himself. He has the divine knowledge. He's all-knowing. You know, he has a divine knowledge. He understands what the, what the woman's life, past life was. And that opens up his, her heart. That opens up her heart, make her realize, you know, the sin in her life and, what, and who she is now talking to. So, yeah, when you go and sh share gospel with your friends or your relatives, whatever, don't be afraid because you have spirit with you. And don't expect, you know, don't, don't worry, you know. You don't need to have all the answers. Don't answer them, actually, sometimes. Just share what God has done in your life. I think that testimony is much stronger than your answer because the testimony give the answer already. You know? So, well, let's come back to the scripture. <laughs> um, So I think uh, the woman start accepting or opening his heart, her heart to the gospel. You can, he, she realized, wow, these guys know my past. He must have some special power. And even though she's trying to say, well, we're not the same as you. You know, you Jews worship in Jerusalem. We worship in you know, um, Samaria, we have our own temple. But Jesus said, there's a time coming, it's a new era that you, we will, we will worship the God together in spirits. That means Jesus is already saying that if you accepted us, if you accepted me as your Lord and Savior, you will be worshiping God together in spirit and in truth. It's not about Jerusalem. It's not about your temple. God is everywhere. What's that word? Omni, omnipresent. Thank you. <laughs> I have a blank in my head. <laughs> it's, it's the 60th, 60th moment. I'm allowed to have that. <laughs> so it's God is omnipresent and we you know Jesus gave her actually the answer she needs she's trying to give excuses to say that oh we, we can't you know worship your God you know because we're different and all that but Jesus is giving the give her the perfect answer and salvation is also she he stressed, salvation is coming from the Jews. And the true worshipper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Just now we just had our worship time, didn't we? And very well worship time. <laughs> led, by our, led by our reverberators, you know? And it was a beautiful time. But mind you, worship is not just about coming on Sunday and singing songs. Worship is about worshiping our God, acknowledging our Creator, having that open up that connection with Him while you're worshiping Him, while you're praising Him. While you, um, yeah, talking to him. 
And also, worship doesn't restrict on Sunday morning. For, you know, for Christ's followers, our worship is in every part of our lives. Whether it's at your work, whether you are at school, whether you are helping out an elderly woman getting up on the bus, or whether you're helping an old lady crossing the road. These are all acts of worship because you do it not because you want to do it, probably you want to do it, but because it's a compelling feeling in your heart that you want to do it and give glory to God. So, as the conversation continues, in verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Now, it's not many times in the Bible that Jesus actually revealed himself as the Messiah. If you count, you can probably count with five fingers. <laughs> okay? Um, but because it, he is in Samaria. There's no Jews around him. And he's along with a Samaritan woman. He can declare, you know, his true status. He is the Son of God. God himself. The Creator. So as Jesus revealed his true status, you know, his true identity to the lady, obviously, wow. You know, I mean, imagine if you're standing in front of the well next to the lady, what's your reaction? You say, wow, okay. <laughs> uh, so as the... Um, Conversation continues. At that time, just, just after Jesus had uh, revealed his identity, the disciples returned from you know, buying food. And then they find, him, find Jesus talking to a Samaritan lady. I said, oh. they, they all puzzled. Why is he talking to a Samaritan woman? You know? Anyway, that's beyond, beside the point. What happened to the Samaritan woman? Verse 28. Leaving her water jar, the, water went, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? As the woman went back to town, she, she even left the water jar in the well. This is one tiny thing that we miss. She was in such a hurry or she was in such excitement. Wow, I'm, I've seen the Messiah. I must tell my fellows, my, my mates, my friends, my relatives. I've seen the Messiah come and meet him. He will have all the goodies for us. So he even left the jar. He forgot about what she's supposed to do. And she went back to town and talked to all the, all the guys in, in town, you know. Hey, guys, come and see. Come and meet this guy. He could be the Messiah. He knows everything, what I did, you know. And he knew, you know, a lot of much deeper spiritual things. In verse 30, they came out of town and made their way towards him. So it was a huge, I would call, missional movement. You know, what Jesus did, the conversation, talking to this lady, actually caused the whole town to come out and look for Jesus. So in verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him 
because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Now, that wasn't a, a, a common practice for Jesus to stay uh, with those people for two days, but he did. That was his divine appointment, I would say, <laughs> or divine purpose. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. So, because Jesus stayed there for another two days, they spent time talking to a lot of people in the town and explaining about a lot of things on the spiritual side of things. And this has brought a lot, of, lot more people come to Christ. And that give us, actually set us a perfect example for mission work. Number one, we don't do the work ourselves. It's God who does. It's the Spirit that works. It's the Word of God. The Spirit and the Word of God will help to soften people's hearts and will help people to turn away from their sins and accept Christ as the Lord and Savior. So, if you look, at, look back on the whole story, the Samaritan woman's heart changed from actually rejecting Get all about the slice. <laughs> so start from a rejection. It's, it, it's actually totally rejected Jesus. You Jews, don't don't talk to me. I I'm not good, you know. I'm I'm a Samaritan woman, you know. And men never talk to ladies in those days anyway. And also because of his his, his, his sinful past, he doesn't want to talk to anyone. He came to the well alone. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He initiated that conversation with a woman. He tries to offer her the gift of life and eternal life. A water that spring that well up in her, in her heart, that will he, she will never be thirsty. And so, after revealing, especially Jesus revealing her past, that softened the, the, the lady's heart. The lady re starting to realize ooh, who this guy was, who this guy is, maybe. Yeah, he's the Messiah. And also, you know, it's, this gift is not going to, she's not going to let go. And she's willingly accepted. And also, she wants to share with all her mates, all her relatives in town. The change of hearts in a Samaritan woman give us a lot of insights in our mission work when we share our Gospels. So, don't worry. If you want to or pray, the Take 5 movement is tough because you've got to pray every day. But, as Christians, I think we should try to bring the gospel to people around us. And that's one purpose that God put us here. It's one, there's also that purpose that God put you in your workplace. It's also the same purpose God put you among your friends. 
among your schoolmates. This is a general calling we call. Okay? Everyone, every Christian has a general calling. This calling is go and make disciples. Teach them what I've taught you. Show them, you know, how my grace and my love works out in pans out in your life and bring them to Christ. Good? Okay, let's have a prayer before we uh, conclude the service. Okay. Lord, thank you for the message. Thank you for the story of the Samaritan woman. Lord, we uh, know, yes, sometimes um, we, we always think of the impossible or think of all the hurdles as we go and uh, share the gospel with our friends or our relatives. And we always sort of tend to back off uh, when they make excuses or when they, they sort of have uh, give negative answers. Lord, help us. Help us to really rely fully, wholly on the Spirit to guide us. And also help us to pray. Pray for those people that we really like them to have this gift of life this living water, this living spring that they can enjoy the grace, the peace, the love that we are experiencing and help us to, to bring them to your tab tabernacle and bring honor and glory to you. We pray in all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Uncle Aiden. That was really good, actually. <laughs> I was like, it's a very, it's a very long um, scripture reading to choose, but you really nailed every point. So thank you so much for your message. If we can all stand, and in response, we're going to sing, O Come to the Altar.
receive these streams of living water that Jesus promised, please come chat to me. Or if you need prayer for anything as well, I'll, I'll be here. Uh, without further ado, though, I'm sure a lot of you are hungry and eager to get to lunch. Uh, have a good weekend. Um, and if you need anything, come chat to me as well or Eden. So see you guys. See you guys next week. See you soon. I'm glad someone's hyped.